Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. The rule to move forward the foreign aid package for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan has passed on the House floor. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more from the Capitol. With 316 votes in favor and 94 votes against, the procedural vote to advance with Speaker Johnson's proposed plan to send supplemental foreign aid to Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan was approved in the House floor despite opposition from House Republicans. Right before votes were casted, I caught up with Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar, the Republican from Florida, who sits in the Committee of Foreign Affairs, and she downplayed the divisions within the Republican Party. Let's listen. Republicans are united except two or three people that are just voting uh, in a way that we don't understand. We are the United States. We have to behave accordingly. No more of this nonsense. Over 50 House Republicans voted against the procedural vote. Most of them voted against it because it did not have any border security provisions. After votes were casted, I caught up once again with Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar to ask her about this. Let's listen to what she had to say about the lack of border security provisions in the bill. What do you have to say to those people who are begging for border security and it's not included in this bill? Well, I agree that we have to secure the border and that's why I have introduced legislation. And yeah, border security is a number one priority for this country. Yeah, but the fact that we have that responsibility, that does not mean that you cannot assume or pay attention to other responsibilities that we have as uh, the leader of the free world. Also, right before votes were casted, I spoke with Congressman Mark Green, the chairman of the Committee on Homeland Security, and I asked him if he thought that we were seeing a coalition government since Republicans and Democrats both joined together to pass this procedural vote. Let's listen to what Congressman Mark Green had to say. Thank Congressman, you. are we seeing a coalition government? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we'll have to see how this vote comes out. It'll, it'll tell you the answer right away, won't it? Right after votes were casted, I caught up with Congressman Bob Good, chairman of the Freedom Caucus, and also with Congressman Matt Gates, a member of the Freedom Caucus, and I asked them the same question. Are we evidencing, are we seeing a coalition government, at least in the House of Representatives? And this is what they had to say. Let's listen. Since Mike Johnson, sorry, what did you say? A coalition government in the House? Yes. I think I've been very public and consistent that I am not in favor of that. Here we are once again. We just passed a rule with predominantly Democrat votes. Uh, the bill, I believe, will also be predominantly Democrat votes tomorrow. Congressman, are we seeing a coalition government, or at least in the House? Uh, it seems as though the coalition to proceed onto this foreign aid bill doesn't include House conservatives. And I think that's going to rile a lot of Republican voters. Over 300 congressmen, including Republicans and Democrats, joined together to vote in favor of this procedural vote. That means that more Republicans voted for the supplemental aid package to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan than they did for the reauthorization of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act or the appropriations process for fiscal year 2024. Now, despite that, only three congressmen have expressed their support to uh, join in a motion to vacate the speakership. Those are Congressman Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia, who filed the motion over three weeks ago, uh, Congressman Tom Massey from Kentucky, and today Congressman Paul Gosar uh, joined the list of uh, three congressmen who support a motion to vacate. I also spoke with Congresswoman uh, Ana Paulina Luna and asked her, as a member of the Freedom Caucus, if she supported a motion to vacate the speakership, and this is what she had to say. I'm not going to comment on that unless it's called up, but what I can tell you is, you know, we have to turn this around immediately. I think that Johnson, I don't know what's going on with him, but this is not what he promises when he was Speaker. So it is expected that this Saturday, uh, Republicans and Democrats will once again reconvene in the House of Representatives to debate and vote on a final passage or not of this foreign aid package. If it does pass the House floor, it will be sent to the Senate, who right now is actually debating the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which has not been reauthorized and would expire tonight at midnight. Back to you. The Biden administration staying quiet on the reported Israeli strikes against Iran. The messaging strategy comes as the U.S. seeks to calm tensions in the Middle East, while Hamas is said to be blocking a ceasefire. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more. The White House taking a quiet approach, declining to confirm or comment on the reported Israeli strikes on Iran overnight. The White House press secretary today repeating the same response over and over again that we do not have any comment uh, on the reports at this time. I'm not going to comment. I'm going to be super mindful. I'm not going to speak to this. I'm not going to sure. give I comments. Just... 
Explosions were heard over Iran in the early hours of Friday. That says Israel for days has been vowing to respond after Iran fired hundreds of drones and missiles toward Israel last weekend. And now Israel has also yet to say anything about the latest strikes on Iran. And Iran has been downplaying the incident in a sign that the two countries might be trying to prevent a broader conflict. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, while also declining to talk about the incident, said the U.S.'s goal is to de-escalate. The United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Uh, what we're focused on is our work to de-escalate. And as the Biden administration has been calling for a temporary ceasefire to get hostages out of Gaza, Blinken said on Friday that Hamas is the side that's blocking one from happening. The only thing standing between the Gazan people and a ceasefire is Hamas. It's rejected generous proposals from Israel. Blinken adds that Hamas seems to be more interested in a regional conflict than in a ceasefire that would improve the lives of the Palestinian people. Reporting from the White House, Aris Tao, NTD News. Iran's military commented on the reported Israeli airstrike, saying that it caused no damage at all. But a Middle East security expert explains why the Iranian regime might be downplaying the incident. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. On Friday, a commander in Iran's military said Iran's air defense systems fired at a suspicious object over the Iranian city of Isfahan. The city is significant because it's home to some of Iran's nuclear facilities. The Iranian commander's announcement came shortly after Israel reportedly conducted a retaliatory airstrike on Iran early Friday morning. He said the sound heard early in the morning was not an explosion, but rather Iran's air defense firing at a suspicious object that caused no damage at all. Iran's state-run media also downplayed the reported strike, saying that all nuclear facilities and military centers in Isfahan were completely secure. And the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed on Friday that there was no reported damage to nuclear sites in Iran. In Tehran, a resident reacted while standing in a crowd that was shouting death to Israel. For now, nothing has happened that would need a reaction by Iran. Israel has to go and do something about the slap it received. The man's comments were likely about the more than 300 missiles and drones Iran fired at Israel about a week ago. And 99 percent of them were intercepted by Israel, the United States and other allies, according to U.S. and Israeli officials. But after such a successful defensive joint military operation, could Israel's alleged strike on Iran really have been unsuccessful? Middle East security expert Jonathan Lord said Iran's state-run media could be downplaying the incident to prevent further escalation. And he said Israel could have hit sensitive nuclear and drone facilities in the city of Isfahan, but chose not to and only struck near them to prove a point. Uh, they chose this target uh, probably because it was none of those and could demonstrate while Israel reserves the right to strike those more sensitive targets, uh, they weren't going to do that this evening. Uh, to use a baseball an analogy, I would call this a, a fastball up and inside to brush the batter back, uh, but uh, uh, not necessarily intended to actually hit the batter tonight. As tensions in the Middle East continue to escalate, the world will be watching to see whether and how Iran will respond. Jason Perry, NTD News. Joining me now to analyze the current conflict between Israel and Iran is David Wormser, Middle East Affairs Analyst at Center for Security Policy. David, thanks so much for joining us. What is your analysis of the strike in Iran? Reports are noting it appears to be limited in scope. What did you make of it? Yes, it was extremely limited. I think the Israelis were showing their capability, and I think they were showing a, a certain degree of warning to Iran they took out not only a site near the nuclear facility, they took out the air defense system of that nuclear facility. So they made it very clear to Iran that they, that site was vulnerable. They could take it out any time they want. So it's warning Iran not to go nuclear, which is a great concern for the Israelis because the Iranians are very close and they're, they're monitoring to make sure that they don't move forward. So this is a warning in that regard. The other thing, of course, is that the Israelis 
uh, the, the, the strike happened. The Iranians didn't even know it was coming and didn't even feel it until it happened. So the Israelis are essentially warning the Iranians that they can, they can touch them, come out and uh, hit them anytime they want at will without even losing a plane or even having a plane in, endangered. And there were weapons used that, that, that were unknown of. So I think it's basically, as your reporter had suggested, it's like a brush, a brush back pitch. Uh, but it might also be a down payment for something bigger later, because the Israelis have other fish to fry right now for the moment. But they did need to make a statement that they'll come back and do this eventually. Hmm. Now, expanding on that, given this muted response from both sides of this attack, Iran has downplayed it. What is the message here that both sides can strike each other, but neither wants escalation? Or how should we read this? Well, I think the message that the Israelis tried to send was that, that Iran cannot strike Israel successfully, meaningfully, because despite their nearly 400 missiles, not one got through. Well, one got through and damaged the runway slightly, but not one made any real difference. Whereas the Israelis only shot one or two missiles, and both missiles took out the air defense system of Iran in a sensitive site. So I think the point Israel's making is, Israel's not vulnerable, Iran is. So uh, Iran should take that lesson, is the Israeli attitude, as Israel goes after its proxies, the Iranian proxies that have been sent to fight wars with Israel. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken didn't elaborate on the attack, saying only that the U.S. wasn't involved in any offensive operations. Now, the U.S. has sanctioned two organizations for fundraising on behalf of violent Israeli extremists in the West Bank, and the EU also sanctioned extremist settlers. Where do you see U.S.-Israel relations going from here? Well, it's, it's uh, obviously there's tensions. I mean, there's, Israel was hit by nearly 400 missiles, and the immediate reaction of the United States is, don't do anything, it might escalate. Uh, well, 400 missiles is an escalation, and not doing anything in the Middle East projects weakness. So there was already tensions there. The second thing is, uh, distancing itself from Israel doesn't help either. That's exactly why the Iranians are doing this. They want to drive a wedge between the United States and Israel, and they see the United States is so frightened of Israel's reactions that essentially it shuts Israel down. And that's exactly what the Iranians want to show the region, that Israel is being shut down by the United States and can be attacked with impunity. So I think these are very damaging uh, uh, sentiments or the signals being sent by Washington that in the end the Iranians interpret as weakness and therefore they'll go after the United States more. So these signals don't de-escalate, these signals actually escalate the situation and inflame it. David Wormser, Middle East Affairs Analyst at Center for Security Policy, thank you so much for joining us. Has the world forgotten October 7th, Israel's 9-11? Kelly Wright traveled to Israel to speak to survivors and hostages' family members. They vow never to forget as they combat anti-Semitism and fight for freedom. Watch Hope for Israel, an NTD News primetime special on Friday, April 26th at 10 p.m. Eastern here on NTD. Five remaining alternate jurors were sworn in today, making up the full jury panel for the New York criminal trial of former President Trump. Opening statements are expected to begin on Monday. Meanwhile, outside the courthouse, a man sets himself on fire. Our legal correspondent Arlene Richards has the details. An unexpected incident caught police by surprise outside the courthouse where the final members of a jury were selected for the first criminal trial of former President Trump. New York City Police Chief Jeffrey Madry explains what happened. We observe a male walk into the park. He walks to the center of the park. When he's in the park, he starts shuffling around his clothes. He opens up a book bag. From the book bag, he takes numerous pieces of papers, uh, pamphlets out. He throws the pamphlets throughout the park. And then he pulls out a canister and pours some kind of liquid on himself, a liquid we believe is an accelerant and he lights himself on fire. Madri assured reporters that the man didn't breach any security protocols. The public information officer, Tariq Shepard, said there was already a large security plan in place and that the two-minute response time for this unexpected event was, quote, pretty quick. 
Chief of Detectives Joe Kenny identified the man as Maxwell Azzarello from St. Augustine, Florida. Police report he is currently in very critical condition in a Manhattan burn center. Newsweek reports that Azzarello was holding a sign before the incident, which included a link to a Substack site. He posted a letter on the site which said he would set himself on fire outside the Trump trial. In the eight-page letter, Azzarello said he is an investigative researcher who believes the government is planning an apocalyptic fascist world coup. Kenny said Azzarello appeared to be spreading conspiracy theories. So how will the New York Police Department handle this incident? We're going to go back to the command. We'll talk to our federal partners and we'll make decisions. If we need to tighten up security, maybe we'll shut down the park. This is something that we'll determine once we talk with all our partners. Meanwhile, inside the courthouse, five remaining alternate jurors were sworn in before lunch. These alternates joined 12 jurors and one other alternate who will decide the fate of the former president. Trump spoke to reporters before entering the courtroom. So thank you very much. As you know, I've been saying for a long while, this is a rigged trial. It's coming from the White House. They have White House DOJ people in the trial, in the DA's office, representing the DA because he's probably not smart enough to represent himself. As a guy got elected using Trump. The Friday morning session kicked off with 22 prospective jurors remaining out of a pool of 96. Six were dismissed throughout the question phase of the proceeding. The judge then dismissed three people for cause, and lawyers used their peremptory strikes to dismiss another two potential jurors. Judge Juan Mershon advised the jurors to return Monday for opening statements. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. How is China responding to tensions in the Middle East? Experts on Capitol Hill today discuss whether the Chinese regime is trying to use the war for its own benefit. Entity's Washington correspondent Jack Bradley has the details. Is the Chinese regime exploiting the war in the Middle East for its own economic benefit? This was the subject of a Friday hearing at the U.S.-China Economic and Security Commission. For years, the Chinese regime has been building economic relations with Israel, but that all changed after the October 7th Hamas terrorist attack. This includes Beijing's silence in not condemning the attack. There is a strain of thought in Chinese strategic thinking that the U.S. having problems in the region is all we need. And that's, that should be the goal of, of Chinese policy. And, and China shouldn't play a constructive role reducing tensions because that would just extend U.S. hegemony and U.S. strategic reach in the region. John Alterman, the director of the Middle East program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, said China isn't looking to solve the conflict in the Middle East, but rather to capitalize on it. He said China's goal is to have a Middle East in which the U.S. doesn't have long-standing partnerships but only transactional relationships and that Beijing's offers to build infrastructure in the Middle East are for its own benefits. Regarding the Chinese regime's human rights abuses, its treatments of the Muslim Uyghurs has been ignored by many Middle Eastern countries doing business with China. The Chinese government made very specific demands about how you talk about the Uyghur issue, and Arab governments complied. As more hearings like this unfold, it remains to be seen how the U.S. responds as the Chinese regime attempts to expand its influence in the Middle East. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. China is inside critical U.S. infrastructure. FBI Director Christopher Wray says they are waiting for the right time to strike. NTD's Dave Martin has more. China is positioning its enormous hacking enterprise to give itself the ability to physically wreak havoc on our critical infrastructure at a time of its choosing. In a speech at Vanderbilt University Thursday, FBI Director Christopher Wray says China's hackers outnumber FBI personnel 50 to 1, not including the number of cyber criminals China hires. Hackers have successfully infiltrated America's communications, manufacturing, utility, transportation, construction, maritime, government, information technology, and education sectors. It considers every sector that makes our society run fair game in its bid to dominate on the world stage. 
and that its plan is to land low blows against civilian infrastructure to try to induce panic. Ray says the FBI is going after China's own infrastructure and its hackers, along with everyone who works with them. The government has partnered with private firms to shut down many of China's threats to America's infrastructure. These attacks uh, can actually have significant devastating impact on human lives. A cybersecurity attack uh, on a hospital could in fact cause human death, and its cyber attack on a water treatment plant could uh, result in impure or dangerous water being provided to, you know, thousands or millions of citizens. Cybersecurity expert David Ratner says much of America's infrastructure wasn't designed with cybersecurity in mind. Systems are improving, but China is trying new ways to break in. China's embassy in Washington says some in the U.S. have been using origin tracing of cyber attacks as a tool to hit and frame China, claiming the U.S. to be the victim while it's the other way around. FBI Director Christopher Wray says hacking victims need to immediately contact the FBI because the FBI can gather key information from victims, then use that information to help them and prevent other attacks. This is Dave Martin for NTD News. Maine earlier this week became the latest state to approve a national popular vote law, meaning the state will award its electoral college votes to the winner of the national popular vote. Earlier, we spoke with Hans von Spakovsky, senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, to find out more about the impact. Hans von Spakovsky, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. To begin, help us understand what's in this main law. Help break it down for us. Well, there's this national compact. A compact is an agreement between states that Maine has unfortunately uh, just joined. And what the compact says is, is that once enough states have joined it who represent 270 electoral college votes, that's the number needed uh, to, to be elected president, uh, they will begin awarding their electoral college votes not, not to the candidate who won the most votes in their state, but to whoever won the national popular vote. Uh, there are many reasons that a state should not join this compact. Uh, the most obvious one is it's, it's unconstitutional. It can't go into effect unless Congress approves it, which they never will, because all compacts, agreements between states, constitutionally have to be approved by the U.S. Congress. On that note, what does the Constitution say about the Electoral College? How likely are we to see legal challenges to this main law? Sure. Uh, the way our Electoral College works is each state gets uh, a number of Electoral College votes equal to their two senators plus uh, the number of members they have of the U.S. House. And it's those Electoral votes that actually determine who the president is. There's a good reason for using that instead of the national popular vote. It's basically this. Um, the framers of the Constitution wanted this system because they said, if we have a national popular vote system, then candidates will simply go to the big cities and get votes there. They will ignore the smaller states, the more rural parts of the country. And that is just as true, in fact, more so today than it was then, which is why Maine is making a big mistake. Uh, by joining this compact, if it went into, into place, uh, they would basically be ignored. Uh, but why would candidates go there when they can instead go to big cities like New York and LA to get their votes? How would the nation's electoral system be impacted if Congress did allow this measure to pass and if other states were to follow suit? Well, think about what these legislators have done. They have basically, they're being basically disloyal to the voters of their state because they're saying no matter who you vote for in our state, um, the, the presidential candidate who gets our electoral college votes will not be who you think ought to get them, but who all of the other states get them. So for example, in Maine, you know, Maine, Maine is pretty much a blue state. If, if in the next election uh, this were in place and the voters of that state picked the Democratic candidate, but the Republican presidential candidate won the national popular vote, well, then Maine would actually be awarding its 
electoral college votes to the Republican, not the Democrat. So really, this is a disservice to the constituents of the state. We have seen this push for the Electoral College to be abolished and replaced with the popular vote. Why do you think there is that push? Well, this was started uh, right after the 2000 election by a very liberal uh, uh, big political donor out in California. In fact, the main donor was the guy who invented the instant scratch-off lottery ticket. <laughs> uh, and um, apparently he was very upset over uh, uh, George Bush winning the election, and so he started this movement. But as I said, um, the only states that have approved this, and I think it's now up to 17 states, have been blue states. Not a single red state has approved uh, this provision, and I think that's because they understand that it's, it would not be good for their own voters, and frankly, because they understand uh, it actually would be unconstitutional and would not go into effect. The, the folks who put this together, they claim they don't have to get the approval of Congress for it, and that's just wrong. How important is it to preserve this system of the Electoral College? Oh, I think it's very important. Uh, there are many other reasons besides what I've talked about. Frankly, one of the biggest ones is uh, if we switch to a national popular vote system, it would encourage election fraud. And the reason for that is that uh, under the current system, you know, we know California, for example, is going to go for the Democratic candidate with its electoral college votes. So it doesn't matter how many votes somebody could potentially steal in that state. It's not going to change uh, the outcome of what happens in California. But if every vote, every fraudulent vote, could actually change the national outcome, uh, that would be a great incentive for individuals to uh, commit fraud, particularly in jurisdictions that are controlled by one political party. Hans von Spakovsky, thank you so much for your time. Sure, thanks for having me. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here's some today's top headlines. The White House remained quiet on reported Israeli airstrikes on Iran. The U.S. denied involvement in the strikes and urged de-escalation in the Middle East. Iran appeared to downplay the strike. It reported no casualties or damage from the airstrike and said the nuclear facilities were secure. Israel hasn't commented on the strike. The House voted to move forward on the foreign aid package for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. Democrats supported the move, while opposition came from the more conservative members of the GOP. Jury selection is complete in former President Trump's hush money trial as five remaining alternate jurors were sworn in. While the trial was underway, a man set himself on fire outside the courthouse. Joining me now to discuss Trump's historic New York criminal trial is Bob Barr, attorney and former congressman. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you oversaw a historic trial in Congress as the manager of the Clinton impeachment. Trump's New York trial is also historic. It's the first time a former president has ever stood trial. What do you make of the first week of this unprecedented trial? Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you all uh, this evening. The one thing that surprised me more than anything else is that we actually got through the week and have a jury selected, not only the jurors, but the alternate jurors. Uh, I, like many other attorneys watching this case, uh, thought that the jury selection process would consume a great deal more time. But I think it speaks well of uh, the attorneys for Mr. Trump, uh, the prosecutors and the judge that they were able to get through that process uh, without any uh, major problems. Uh, so I think this bodes well for as smooth a trial as we can have given the circumstances. Now, Trump's lawyers are arguing that he should not be questioned about his past legal cases during this trial. Prosecutors argue that he should. Why might this line of questioning be relevant to the prosecution and what type of impact could it have on the jurors? If, in fact, Mr. Trump takes the stand in his own defense, which I, as a trial attorney uh, and who follows politics, would definitely 
not advise him to do in the strongest terms possible. But if he were to do this, then, of course, like any other uh, defendant who takes the stand uh, in a criminal case, uh, he opens himself up to have his credibility uh, questioned and basically attacked. Uh, so other cases in which he was a party or perhaps even a witness uh, that uh, impact uh, or you know, have to do with his credibility uh, basically is fair game. Uh, there has to be some probative value to it in terms of his credibility and his veracity. But if he takes the stand, uh, all the gloves are going to come off. Hmm. Trump's team is trying to change the trial's venue from Manhattan, arguing that seating a jury in three days with so many potential jurors being dismissed over bias is, quote, untenable. Now, Congressman, is there grounds for moving this trial? And is it possible to ever get a truly fair trial when the defendant is a former president and effectively a presidential nominee? Of course, uh, we've never had this before. So your question is, uh, on the one hand, a very, very good one. On the other hand, uh, we simply don't know and will never know because uh, this has never happened before. But the simple fact that a defendant in a criminal case, whether it's in New York or in my state of Georgia or a federal case somewhere, uh, is well known to the jurors, uh, is not in and of itself disqualifying for the jurors. And if, in fact, after the what's called the voir dire, the questioning of the potential jurors, uh, pleases both sides uh, to the degree that the people selected uh, can, in fact, put aside their opinions and preferences and initial prejudices and look at the evidence fairly as it's presented, uh, then uh, I don't think that, well, if that's the case, there's no grounds to move the trial, and that appears to be the case here. So I think we basically moved beyond that at this point. This week, the focus has been on the jurors and jury selection process. But, Congressman, in your view, should this case ever have been brought to trial to begin with? No. In my opinion, as both a former uh, federal prosecutor, as a defense attorney, and as, uh, like yourself, a concerned citizen, I don't think it's an appropriate case. I think that the prosecutor in New York, Mr. Bragg, uh, is basically taking uh, some potential old misdemeanor cases and concocting a felony case out of this uh, that I think is, uh, is trumped up, uh, so to speak. Uh, I think it's old. I think it uh, should not be uh, before the uh, jury. Uh, and I think uh, it purely is, uh, is politics here. Can he bring it? Yes. Should he have brought it? Absolutely not. On that note, Trump has been mandated by the judge to be in court for every moment of the trial, which could last up to eight weeks now. Trump says this is election interference since he should be out campaigning. In your view, is this trial interfering with the United States democratic process? It certainly is interfering with his campaign, although one could argue that uh, he benefits from it because whenever he goes out uh, after the trial each day, or in this case, the jury selection, uh, his numbers seem to go up. He has uh, all of the cameras, uh, all of the media is there. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that requiring a defendant to be in the trial guards against a potential uh, appellate issue. If, in fact, Mr. Trump was not there for one day or two days or however much of the trial, then that would be uh, grounds uh, probably for his lawyers uh, to argue uh, that uh, he did not receive a, a, fair, uh, a fair trial because he wasn't there to confront witnesses and watch the proceedings. So uh, I've had cases where defendants have been required to attend even though they didn't want to. Uh, so this is standard procedure, basically. Former Congressman Bob Barr, thank you so much for joining us. Certainly. Lawmakers from both parties are expressing outrage at the Chinese embassy. It's reportedly lobbying against a TikTok bill that would ban the app unless it's sold by its Chinese parent company. And meanwhile, Beijing just launched a whole new branch of the military dedicated to information systems. NDD's Virginia Gibson has more.
The Senate is considering a TikTok bill to require the app to separate from its Chinese parent company, ByteDance, or else be banned from U.S. app stores. Politico reported on Wednesday that the Chinese embassy met with congressional staffers to lobby against it. Democratic Senator Mark Warner said it comes as no surprise that Xi Jinping is heavily invested in preventing a TikTok divestiture, which would put American data and TikTok's potential for malign influence out of the hands of the CCP. Republican Senator Marco Rubio said the lobbying efforts of the Chinese embassy reveal their true agenda protecting TikTok as a strategic asset for Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party to influence the United States. At the same time, the Chinese regime ordered Apple to remove WhatsApp and threads from its app store in China. An app tracking firm said Telegram and Signal were also removed from the store Friday. Apple said China ordered the removal of the apps over national security concerns and said it's obligated to follow the laws in the countries where it operates, even when it disagrees. This all comes as China is adding a military branch focused on information and cyber warfare. Beijing announced Friday the new arm is named the Information Support Force. Beijing said the ultimate goal of setting up this new force is to help China fight and win in modern warfare. But an expert says this is nothing new. In fact, these large-scale attacks from China have been occurring continuously and are funded by the Chinese authorities. Previously, they fell under the Strategic Support Force, and now it's just established a new force. But in fact, it's something the Chinese military, they've been doing for decades. Worth noting, the arm is led by the CMC, China's Central Military Commission, which is directly overseen by the regime's leader, Xi Jinping. Virginia Gibson, NTD News. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer at Columbia University today. Anti-Israeli demonstrators remain defiant after police arrested more than 100 of them yesterday. Students carrying pro-Palestinian signs while chanting slogans. Some demonstrators were caught on video chanting, We are Hamas, long live Hamas. On Wednesday, about 100 protesters spent the night camping out on school grounds. Many of the arrests were for trespassing and disorderly conduct. A university spokesperson issued a statement today saying they expect more protests and that they'll continue to enforce rules that apply to protest activity. A California group is battling their state attorney general in court today. They say Rob Bonta misled the public and used biased language in describing their ballot initiatives on parental notification and transgender policy. NTD's David Lamb reports. Parents and supporters of a ballot measure want their initiative to be titled Protect Kids of California Act instead of the Attorney General's Restrict Rights of Transgender Youth. They say that is a biased summary. A lawyer representing supporters of the measure says it's an abuse of the Attorney General's power to oversee these ballot measures where he's legally obligated to be neutral and draft a title and summary that's impartial. The grassroots group submitted their initiatives in August 2023 to be placed on this year's November ballot. It's endorsed by women's sports activist and former NCAA swimmer Riley Gaines and is asking for three things. Require schools to notify parents when their children under 18 wants to socially transition genders in school settings, have gender-specific bathrooms, and only allow females to participate in girls' sports for grades 7 and up, and prohibit puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and transgender surgeries on minors. Bonza has been critical of similar laws, saying, My office will continue to stand up against efforts seeking to jeopardize the rights of our most vulnerable communities. The debate is part of a nationwide issue over local school districts and the rights of parents and LGBTQ plus students. The proposal so far received at least a quarter of the more than 500,000 signatures it needs by May 28th to end up on the ballot in November, according to the Secretary of State's office. But supporters say the language Bonta released hinders their ability to garner enough support before time runs out. David Lamb, NTD News, California. 
And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, plenty to discuss today, but let's start in college sports where the Biden administration released updated Title IX rules. What are some of these significant changes taking place? You know, I think the biggest change was that gender identity has been, has been added to the list of protected classes. Now, the biggest issue of whether males who identify as females can participate in women's sports, that wasn't addressed here. Now, some have theorized anyway that it will happen after the November election. But some people also think that adding ident gender identity as a protected class could result in litigation if a federally funded school refuses some students access into private spaces, you know, reserved for the opposite sex, like bathrooms and sports locker rooms. Now, one other change is that colleges cannot suspend student athletes who are accused of sexual misconduct during an active investigation against them. Now, all these changes are scheduled to go into effect on August 1st. Hmm. While staying in college sports, the NCAA has approved coach to player wireless communication for football games starting this fall. Is it fair to say Michigan's sign stealing probe caused this? I certainly think so. Now, they didn't actually say specifically, but that really brought this issue into the forefront last fall. And everybody asked, you know, why they wouldn't just use wire wireless helmet to helmet communication. I mean, the NFL has been doing this since the 1990s. Even some levels of high school football are doing this right now. And given the tens of millions of dollars that go to the major schools, the argument that it would be too costly really seemed unbelievable. And even with this rule, it's optional for teams to use it or not. Now, only one player on offense and one player on defense can actually have this. I mean, it's simply a way for coaches to communicate their play calls without worrying about the other team stealing the, the signs or deciphering what the signs actually mean, like, we, like the Michigan scandal showed. Moving on to WNBA news, rookie Caitlin Clark has already reportedly secured a endorsement deal with Nike worth millions of dollars. Now, is this unusual for someone who has yet to play a pro game? Yeah, very unusual. It really says a lot about our star power. Now, this was reported by the Athletics' Sham Sharenia, who said it's for more than $20 million, and it's reported the same week she's drafted where her salary came out, it's going to be $75,000 a season as a rookie. Now, even before this deal was announced, she wasn't hurting for money. And reportedly, she had the biggest name image likeness deals, totally more than $3 million. But doing this before she's played a game in the pros is very rare, like you said. Now, Nike signed Tiger Woods to a $40 million deal back in 90, 1996. That was just before he turned pro. That deal turned out very really well for both him and Nike. Ditto with Michael Jordan. He signed with Nike in 1984 on the eve of his rookie season. And 40 years later, the Air Jordan shoe is still the most popular brand out there. Now, certainly all signs point to Clark having a similar impact. And given how much interest she's already generated in the women's game, I, I think this looks like it could be a similar win-win uh, situation. Well, shifting gears to the NBA, we have a pair of games tonight that will conclude the play-in tournament. What's at stake here? the final two playoff spots. The two winners tonight get the last two playoff spots in the Eastern and Western conferences, but injuries look like they're gonna play a big part in this. I mean, first in Miami, the Heat hosts the Bulls, but they'll be without six-time All-Star Jimmy Butler. I mean, he's really seen as the heart of this team. He's a tremendous playoff performer, but he earned his MCL in Wednesday's loss to Philadelphia. The winner of this one, though, advances to play Boston in round one. Then in the second game, New Orleans hosts Sacramento, but again, a major injury could factor into this one. Two-time All-Star Zion Williamson, he's out with a hamstring strain, and that happened late in Tuesday's loss to the Lakers. Now, the winner of this game gets Oklahoma City in the opening round. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. And that's all for today's news for Round the Clock coverage. Visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.